Welcome to season three, episode four of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. We are closing out season three before the holidays, and we'll be back in January for our next season filled with inspiring guests, creatives, leaders, activists who are helping organizations and society to be a better place. Thank you for joining us today and for taking that first step in growing personally and professionally. Anyone with a camera, I would encourage you to turn it on and listen with intention. The Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program focuses on three main pillars in developing its students. First, we develop students to create their own business, the traditional view of being an entrepreneur. And we have many alumni who have gone on to create their own companies, sell them, become tech stars, bars, restaurants, cafes, pizza places, you name it. Two, we focus on students to become entrepreneurs or innovators within a firm. And this is just as important to think creatively, entrepreneurially, and innovatively within a firm to drive their business in various ways. And again, I have more than 15 students all working for Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, and the list goes on. But lastly, in our program, we develop students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them, which is what most programs do. And we have several students who are influencers, IG, absolute gangsters, who are creating careers that did not exist and creating that journey of what they envision for their lives. Our next guest, I'm really happy that he agreed to be on our Open Educator Show. I've known him for almost 20 years, and I struggle sometimes for the words uh, to describe our next guest, but he's someone that I look up to who, what I see looking in or from the outside, who has crafted his career, his journey, and been very purposeful in the decisions he makes in order to create this career trajectory. And it's almost he's a master of that. And he will share a bit about this experience. He's what we call, if we relate it to our content in class, these internal champions of, at work, those key individuals that organizations and leadership need in order to accomplish and orchestrate big projects that make those companies look good. In fact, we know his work. We've experienced it when we travel. He is at the foundation of curating the experiences that we have while we travel from beginning to end. And our next guest will be experiencing his journey. So please give a warm welcome for Director of Airport Operations, Experience and Transformation at United Airlines, Stem Stephen Temerillo. Steve, welcome. Thank you. For joining us where does this tuesday morning find you and can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on sure well thank you for the very kind introduction steve yeah it's crazy it's been almost 20 years my how time flies um, so i'm actually in denver today um, so denver colorado here where the temperature literally goes from 80 degrees into 30 degrees in about the same 24-hour period um, so I'm actually working from home today. I moved here from Chicago about six months ago. Um, United's corporate headquarters is in the Sears Tower, the now Willis Tower, um, right downtown. But obviously, as the work has transformed over the last 18 months, um, you know, we've all moved around quite a bit as well. So I made the decision to move to Denver about six or seven months ago. Um, it's been an awesome transition from here. Uh, and so essentially kind of just taking the work here. Um, Denver is just as big as O'Hare for folks that have traveled. Um, you probably connected in Chicago, O'Hare, or perhaps Denver at some point in your travels. Um, but essentially kind of doing the work from home thing today. Um, I'm flying back to Chicago tomorrow morning. And we actually have our first leadership summit in 24 months um, back in Chicago. It's going to be at the United Center. We'll be somewhat socially distanced, um, spread out a little bit in the large um, complex where the Blackhawks and the Bulls play. Um, but yeah, doing lots of work um, in terms of our transformation work. I know we're going to talk in a lot more detail on that in a couple of minutes so we can go into some of the nitty gritty there. Um, but today on the agenda, it's everything from hiring summer interns to um, our USA Summer Ambassador Program, a mentorship program that we do. Um, also working on, we're doing a cool fourth and goal program to rally our teams in terms of safety, reliability, and operational metrics going into the busy holiday season, which starts at the beginning of next week. 
So um, I'm a big Post-it fan. You can see I have Post-its plastered around everywhere with kind of all the things to do today. Inevitably, though, that's kind of one of the cool things of the aviation airline industry. You know, you often start with a list of 20 things, but probably only get to about a dozen of them just because there's a lot of fire drills and things always coming up. So um, yeah, really excited to be here today and to dive deep and look forward to chatting with you both, Chad and Kaylee, um, and definitely hopefully saving some time at the end for some questions and answers as well. Wonderful, and I look forward to unpacking those throughout this hour session. One thing that I wanna take a step back is this fascinating career that I mentioned of curating your experiences. And a lot of students and individuals are trying to, you know, once they graduate, they get their first job, um, and it may be just a taste of what their whole future career, but maybe you can sh share a little bit about your journey because I know it's taken what could be seen as detours, but you've been able to package it into big building blocks or steps to get you where you are today. Maybe you can share a bit about that. Yeah, so one of my kind of undergrad business professors told me early on that, you know, you're often not going to get that very first job, the dream job. Everyone, I think, dreams of going to Apple or Facebook or Instagram or, you know, you name it, kind of whatever company is on your top three list, kind of the A list, as I say. And, you know, often getting that first sort of role and getting that first experience is really pivotal in kind of, as you said, the foundational steps to kind of the future career. And so I went to Michigan. I grew up in the suburbs of Metro Detroit, just outside of Ann Arbor. Um, always a Michigan fan and go blue. Um, I was just at the Penn State Michigan game this past weekend in State College, which was tons of fun to get the big victory. Um, but yeah, so went to Michigan. Um, kind of the suburb I grew up with was halfway between Detroit and Ann Arbor. So I actually commuted to Michigan. Um, a lot of people don't even know or realize that. Uh, but because I was so close, I would save a little bit of money for the first year um, and do that. And so I ended up just continuing to commute. And so I was always interested in kind of this travel, hospitality, leisure space. Um, but much like now, kind of coming off of the COVID pandemic, things were really crazy back during 9-11. I was a freshman at Michigan during 9-11, was walking to class as kind of the first plane went through um, the Twin Towers in New York City. And kind of as we knew it, kind of the world changed, obviously, that day. Um, and kind of the travel industry as well, um, very much kind of soft for the next couple of years. So I ended up in the radio world. I was always kind of a radio nerd as well, would call the radio station to be caller number nine to win concert tickets um, at the radio stations in Detroit. And so I was fortunate just chatting with one of the DJs, sent my resume, had no intention of working in the radio media world, didn't know there was really even jobs or internships. Um, but kind of through a series of steps and conversations, ended up waking up at two in the morning, kind of two or three days a week um, when I was going to Michigan, would get breakfast for the morning show, uh, would answer the phones for the listeners when folks were calling in for contests, would screen some of the phone calls. Um, and then ultimately that really just led to kind of my first kind of, I guess, true professional kind of collegiate experience. I worked in a library, obviously, um, you know, in high school and into college a little bit. But this was kind of the first taste into the real business world. So tons of fun, you know, it wasn't really probably until six, seven months into the internship that I met um, our VP of programming at the time, you know, teaches you, you know, really you need to say hello to every single person. I learned that pretty early on in my career. You know, it's, you know, shame on me for not, you know, knocking on his door, walking past kind of the exit of the building, you know, for those first six months. Um, but, you know, I started having conversations with him kind of throughout the course of the next several weeks and months. And he started kind of taking me under his wings. You know, how does the business side work? How do we bring, bring revenue into a radio station? How do we sell, you know, advertisements? Um, at the time, the digital world was just starting to transform. That was probably back in like 20 or 2003, 2004, um, monetizing the digital world, the streaming platforms, things like that. Um, so I ended up staying there for two or two years, rather, um, through most of my career at Michigan. It was an awesome experience. Um, did a market research internship kind of in the middle of that summer as well. Um, I realized that, you know, having fun while you work is really, really what it's all about. You know, I think everyone, you know, dreams of these eye banking careers and consulting and they're all awesome. It's I have many of my classmates from business school that went that route. Um, but if you love what you do and have fun every day, it's never really going to be work. Uh, and so I was fortunate to kind of transition from Michigan. I had job offers from the radio world in Toledo, Ohio, a much smaller city than Chicago, Illinois, uh, as well as staying back in the Detroit area. And then kind of at the 11th hour, I had an offer that opened up in Chicago at the Clear Channel iHeartRadio cluster there. So did what kind of felt most uncomfortable. Um, had never really moved or left the state of Michigan before in terms of career, left my family. Um, had lived at home, like I said, because I had um, lived at home and commuted during those four years at Michigan. Um, but it was the most uncomfortable kind of decision, but it was definitely the right one. 
Uh, and so moved to Chicago, literally making $30,000 a year to start. Um, if I would have needed to have a car, I wouldn't have been able to afford to even live in the city. Thankfully, Chicago has great public transportation, um, but had a small studio apartment. And that was really kind of the start of the career um, that kind of led to um, the media world um, from that end. This is fascinating. And there's, I mean, we could talk a whole hour just about the, the topics that you brought up. But what I want to highlight is this idea that um, to relate it to maybe practice of where some of uh, the audience might be in their career or, or their education, and then maybe some tips. Because what I'm hearing is e even at the first radio station, the, the mentor said, you need to be saying hello and getting in front of everyone. And I'll ask you later on if this influenced that special project that you're working on that today, or at least if there was some connection. But uh, you know, that that takes a lot of courage, right? You know, you, I, I would imagine you're quite green. I don't know how old you were at the time, 20, 21 or something. And for this individual one to, to be your mentor is, it says a lot about his leadership and his his self as being a, a manager, a, a human. How about a human? I mean, we often miss that in organizations, human, and, and particularly in leadership. But um, for him to take you under the wing and then say, Stephen, go and meet everyone or say hello every every morning. And that gave you some different level of exposure. Was that scary? And how did you get over that? Or, you know, what were the, did you have fears? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think you're walking into this huge building, this large company, you know, these people that are talking on the radio, talking to hundreds of thousands of people every single morning, salespeople, you know, people I had grown up listening to. Um, but, you know, it's I have a pretty outgoing type A personality. So the actual, you know, talking to people or saying hello wasn't the challenge. But it's like, what do you say? How do you craft, you know, first impressions often go a long way to folks. And it's kind of how they perceive you um, and things like that. And so, you know, but just, you know, over the course of those, you know, several months, you know, every day after the show got over and we were off the air, I would just go to a different door and just, you know, walk, you know, knock on someone's door. Do you have five minutes? Can I do a quick introduction? You know, Darren Davis, who was our VP, you know, set him, you know, to come to say hello. And so I think just encouraging you to step out of your comfort zone, whether you're, you know, a type A person that, you know, is comfortable saying hello, whether you're more of a shy kind of, you know, more reserved personality that isn't, you know, and it's hard now, I get it, in this Teams world, kind of this hybrid world where we're kind of on these virtual screens, it's not quite as easy as it was. But, you know, one of the things I started doing early on in COVID was, you know, scheduling one or two just, you know, casual Teams conversations or Zoom conversations every single week. Um, folks that, you know, needed to reconnect with, um, both on a professional level, on a personal level, and, you know, definitely got tiring with the Teams world, but trying to stay in touch with those folks is really, really key. You know, kind of going back to that point earlier, Steve, you know, with saying hello to everyone, you never know which connection, which person it is that you're going to do that's going to make the difference. Uh, like I guess I was coming back from the flight um, from State College. I flew from Pittsburgh back into Denver yesterday and, you know, stand by one of the beauties of kind of the business or airline travel. You kind of get to just jump on the seats for open availability if there's any left. Had a middle seat, which is often the case with standby, but that's okay. You know, on the left, I had a business traveler that was coming, um, flying off to Spokane, connecting in Denver. There was going um, business kind of healthcare professional on the business side. On the other side, had someone that was coming to talk to his team there. And you just never know what those folks are. And so, you know, they, I didn't tell them I worked at United until the very end of the flight. You know, maybe they glanced at my computer screen and saw it. Um, but, you know, gave my business card to each one of those folks at the end of the flight. If they ever need anything, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, we'll definitely probably drop them an email this week. And so we just encourage both of you, Chad and Kaylee, whatever kind of journey, whatever you're in, whether it's, you know, whether you're waiting at a restaurant, whether you're working in a retail job, whether you're putting books away at a library, like my first job, whether you're going as an intern, um, you know, into your first, you know, sort of professional opportunity, just take every single opportunity to, you know, introduce yourself, really to start selling your brand. Again, what you do, you know, making the decision to show up today when you probably have 27 other projects and things to do, all of those essentially reflect your personal brand and you never know what person is gonna influence kind of that next decision, whether they're the CEO of a large Fortune 100 company, whether they're an entrepreneur that's starting a startup business, um, whether they're just a small mom and pop shop um, from there, you know, you just never really know. And so I would just encourage you to step out of the comfort zone. It's definitely going to um, you know, take you to the next level. I want to connect it to some of the things that we're learning in the classroom. One of the exercises is to uh, 
identify who's creative in your life, but also to reach out to someone who inspires you or, or who you think is creative. And this is not so different than what Stephen is mentioning, because uh, it's the idea of going to meet that person, uh, talking, just getting to know them, introducing yourself and, and potentially learning from them in various ways. So there's a reason why you have homework for this, because there is truth to it. And the other part is, Stephen mentioned the, the executive was influencing him or educating him about how the business and, and communications and media uh, was working. And what did he talk about? How to bring biz revenue into the business, how to drive top line revenue. And as we know from our innovation module, this is a largely what innovation is, or at least one specific view of innovation and how we can continue to grow within uh, or, or a firm to grow if we were to look at, at revenue. So this is wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Stephen. These are these are wonderful examples, and thank you for bringing them down to practice and sharing your example. So, after Stephen worked in the media industry, uh, he'll share a bit about maybe what was going on with the media industry. But he decided to continue his learning. If this wasn't enough, you know, he probably was an A plus student, doing all these extra things, taking a hobby from calling the radio station to persuading them to hire him as an intern and then a job later on. But then he went back for more schooling. And maybe you could share a bit about your journey of why or what your thought process was to go back for more schooling. Yeah, I mean, so the media world was definitely at this very transformational point. You know, we were moving from terrestrial, just, you know, radio, television and print media newspapers back in the day to this digital world where, you know, going to the station website, streaming content, all those sort of things. You know, it was difficult at that time to sell them and actually make money. You know, the revenue was still coming in from the advertisers to those kind of big three sort of items from there. And so love the world. It was really fun to be part of that transformatory change from there. But, you know, thought, let's, you know, take it to the next level. Um, you know, media, especially kind of on the marketing side, can sometimes be one of the lower paying sort of fields in the marketing space. And so from an educational perspective, my mom had an MBA. And so she always encouraged, you know, a formal, you know, secondary education kind of after the undergrad degree. Um, you know, with an MBA, something can be said for potentially going and having that work experience. So at that point, I was living and working in Chicago for five years. You know, love the city, had built an awesome book of connections and networking, kind of being in market number three, very serendipitously after Detroit. Um, and then decided, you know, business school was probably the next step. So, you know, for me, since I had commuted um, from campus, it was really important to me to be kind of in that immersed in that college environment. And so I made the decision to only apply to schools where I could actually live kind of on campus and have that collegiate sort of environment. And so I applied to Michigan, UNC, and then Dartmouth Tuck, which is a small school up in the Northeast. Um, ironically, I was president of the Alumni Association. Michigan lost my second GMAT score. So I actually didn't get into Michigan where I did my undergrad, had a decent GPA there. Um, Dartmouth, um, my GMAT score, I'm not the best standardized test taker. Um, and so the score was respectable, but it definitely wasn't at the top tier back in the day when things were pretty competitive. And then North Carolina was really the only other school I applied to, kind of third on the radar. And so I made the decision to kind of step out of my comfort zone, move to the South, um, and never lived in the South before, wasn't really super familiar with the area, and not spent really any time in the state at all. Um, but essentially um, was fortunate to get into the program, you know, quit my job, made the decision to go to the full-time program versus the part-time program. You know, I was somewhat fortunate at the time, you know, in the media world where I wasn't making kind of investment banking, consulting, uh, you know, ad exec sort of money that I was able to do that, knowing that there was going to be an ROI um, going back to school. And so my dad and I packed up the U-Haul from Chicago, made that 14-hour drive back down to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and really kind of immersed into that experience from there. Um, it was really just an exceptional two years, you know, just fully being immersed, having, having had five years of work experience at that point, you know, setting up radio remotes, dressing up as Edison, the light nosed reindeer during Christmas promos. You know, I wasn't shy or timid to do anything. You know, I always say as a people leader, you know, you should never, you know, fear to do anything that you would ask any of your coworkers to do. And so, you know, I had some crazy times, you know, for Thanksgiving, you know, I would always have to do the Thanksgiving Day Parade in Chicago, you know, would often roll into my parents back in Ann Arbor, you know, at three, four o'clock in the afternoon after the parade was done, you know, kind of just in time for dinner to be served um, as the football game was ending. 
Um, but it was really just a really cool experience. You know, that sort of opportunity to just put myself kind of in another uncomfortable zone, living in a new area and a new space. Um, you know, even though I had had a business undergrad, you know, kind of taking it to the next level at the MBA level, you know, with a lot of other people that did a lot more analytical things kind of in their first stints of their career when I was off doing, you know, crazy radio remotes um, and things like that. Um, but it ended up being really much kind of a pivotal changing point in my career um, in terms of kind of going to that next phase. I want to unpack something because, first of all, congrats. It's not easy to get into Chapel Hill, and I know a lot of the top business schools, so I'm, I'm confident that this was not easy, one, to get in. But two, I'm, and you kept saying, referring to take it to the next level. So it, it sounds like you were pretty studious and diligent in your undergrad. And we all like to have fun, of course, in our undergrad. But I'm curious to know, when we say you hunkered down and you focus and you took it to the next level, what does that mean? So this is an individual who's now, I don't know what age you were at this time, but you're older than the traditional student going to, to university, to uni, and now you're, you're investing a lot of money. It's not cheap to go for a full-time MBA. Uh, we're expecting the ROI and all these other things. And then you focus and you are probably spending, I don't know how many hours, and then, but can you maybe give us this, le this level of focus or this level of, um, you say, um, uh, turning it up a notch compared to your undergrad? What was that like? Just to give them uh, some sort of context. Yeah. So, I mean, the first semester of business school was actually very challenging for me. It's like I said, you know, I struggled a little bit with the GMAT, but I wanted to get into that range to get into kind of a top program from there. I really had to work hard. It's, you know, and I, and I had taken these classes before at Michigan. I had taken stats. I had taken Econ 101 and 102, but I was sort of in this level. I actually felt like almost the dumbest one in the room in some of these like finance analytical classes that, you know, that was not my background. That was not what I did when I worked in media. It's, you know, did it and things during undergrad, but I definitely had to work a lot harder than most. Um, to kind of get to that level from there. So I definitely had a lot of sleepless nights and, you know, really just grinding hard, you know, even questioning at some point, was this the right decision? Um, but ultimately, you know, we all sort of find our own niche and path. And so it's like once it got to, you know, some of those more people leading classes, marketing, strategy, things like that, like that was really sort of the time when I started to shine and sort of, um, you know, kind of took it to the next level again. And so it definitely wasn't easy, you know, being kind of in an area, you know, a different region, you know, family wasn't close, things like that. It wasn't working for an airline, so I couldn't just go jump on an, air, an airplane for free like I do now. Uh, and so a lot of learnings just about myself, about my character, about persevering, about just, you know, even when the going gets tough, I think the slogan says the tough keep going. And so, you know, definitely relied on a lot of people, um, things like that. Um, but kind of once, you know, you kind of got through that first semester and things are really a grind, it really, you know, the tide starts to turn. Um, I did a lot of off-campus recruiting as most of my classmates were going to do investment banking, consulting, kind of all those traditional, you know, sort of paths that you go to out of a business school program. I spent many of hours in the small conference room on the fourth floor um, of the business school building in Chapel Hill doing tons of things like this, networking with folks, having conversations with folks uh, at airlines, travel, hospitality, Target, retail, Hershey's, all these sort of companies, you know, that were a little bit more untraditional per se than a lot of my classmates. They were starting to get offers and, you know, when we came back from the holidays in early to mid January, you know, I was still grinding really hard on, you know, old conference calls or wasn't video team screens with high bandwidth internet like we have now but just conference calls with folks with alums from michigan with alums from unc to ultimately kind of make connections and was really fortunate at the end of that kind of third kind of quarter to end up with three internship offers one with best buy up in minneapolis one with mcdonald's in chicago and then um, kind of united came through at the 11th hour just as one of my other offers was about to expire uh, which was really cool. So uh, kind of just re-solidified again, kind of going back to that original conversation with that, you know, radio, uh, my radio leader, Darren, you know, saying hello to everyone, you know, don't ever give up when things are dark, when you're in the middle of a pandemic, when, you know, you don't feel like you're in the right place or, you know, it wasn't exactly it. You know, that was kind of the pivotal moment for me where like, I just 
you know, and I had liked Chapel Hill before, but I definitely, you know, it wasn't, you know, my most favorite semester of that first semester, but the tide started to shift and, you know, ended up with those, you know, opportunities for summer internship offers, you know, got to the place then where I was, you know, much more invested, you know, not laser, as much laser focused on the classes at that point, and it was really focused more on kind of the networking and the career aspect. Um, and then kind of the light bulb just kind of switched and it was really, you know, the best. I just, you know, I love Chapel Hill. I go back for a couple of basketball games every year, have many classmates that now live down in the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill area. And so that was kind of a pivotal point for me. Would you suggest that students can start that process now, meaning contacting alums or contacting business owners or middle management or leadership of any company that you may be? Do you think that would be a good strategy that could be also implemented even on the undergraduate level? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, both Chad and Kaylee, you know, LinkedIn is your best friend. I'd actually just read an article last week that, you know, it's kind of the one social media and platform that, you know, really kind of still has the stronghold and, you know, is doing things, you know, from the business perspective. So, you know, whatever it is you want to do, and I want to hear more about it kind of when we get into the Q&A for each of you, but, you know, start having those conversations. LinkedIn is such a great tool with searching and functionality. You can search by school, you can search by interest, you can search by profession, you can search by, you know, all these sort of filters you can put on things. You know, when I travel for business or even for pleasure, you know, I often just go on and see who's living in that area. What do we have in common? You know, as I was doing some of those initial chats and conversations in that fourth floor conference room in Chapel Hill and some of these kind of niche sort of unique industries that no one else was going into, I had to stretch really far. In some instances, it was, oh, like this person plays golf. OK, like I can maybe form a fluid kind of cohesive email to know that, you know, you're a golfer. This person, you know, grew up in the same place, you know, it often felt like a stretch. But, you know, I often say if you make it feel natural and make it feel comfortable and you can kind of, you know, read the room and understand, you can find a way to have a conversation with anyone. Um, one of my best stories when I was on a business trip in Houston um, was just kind of at this casual bar, you know, was sitting in the middle. I often try to find myself where I can say hello to someone or chat if I'm solo and ended up in this bad, you know, on one side there was this couple that was, you could tell, very unhappy in life. On the other side, there was someone that I think had just went on a bad date. And so I actually literally, I closed out, but I still had a full beer. So I picked myself up and moved to the other side of the bar and sat down next to this guy in Houston, uh, my buddy Matt, who's now a really good buddy. Um, we went to Thailand for 11 days right before COVID, just a random person that I met sitting at this bar in Houston on a business trip, became good buddies and then traveled to Thailand together. Uh, and so it's never too early, you know, start finding those connections, finding reasons, finding ways. You know, I'm happy to send both of you samples, you know, emails I sent back when I was at UNC of introductory emails and things like that. It's really easy now to find people's email addresses as well. Just, you know, most companies, it's first name, dot last name or first name, underscore last name. Um, things like that. And, you know, especially when you're a student, like it's kind of the golden ticket. You literally have that free hall pass to say, you know, I'm, you know, a student, I'm looking for this. And, you know, and don't start out by saying, you know, I'm looking for a job or looking for an internship. Just I want to learn more about what you do. What is your day in the life of things like that? And then kind of as you build that relationship, oftentimes, you know, going from there as kind of I chatted earlier, I'm starting to go through our interview kind of candidates from there. I think we had over 300 applicants on just one requisition for the summer. I'm not going to have time to go through all 300 resumes as a people leader. It's, you know, I have a full time job I'm doing as well. So it's the people that reached out, the people that, you know, had connections, the people, you know, that, you know, had some sort of, you know, introductory sort of filter. Those are obviously the ones that we're going to look higher on onto kind of from an application perspective. And those are the probably the folks that are going to get the interviews. So it's never too early. Um, never do it enough. You know, find every opportunity to sort of use, you know, the social mediums. And, you know, thankfully now with things like Teams and Zoom, you don't have to fly on a plane. You don't have to get, you know, out of bed. It's, you know, I'm wearing shorts on, under my dress shirt here, uh, you know, and so you don't have to get dressed up in a fancy suit and tie anymore. Uh, and so the world is a little bit easier. There's definitely a lot of silver linings, you know, with COVID and kind of how the technology has evolved that make it a lot easier and to do it in different cities as well. And we can talk about kind of that more later on. I would like to transition and how you transition to United and my understanding through the leadership development program, maybe a little bit about that. And then I would like to talk a bit about and framing innovation and how I see you influencing innovation at United. So how was that transition going from, of course, media to Chapel Hill to United? Yeah, I learned a lot and messed up a lot my first year. It's, you know, 
even though Clear Channel iHeartRadio was a larger company, you know, it still didn't really have the, you know, matrix large kind of bureaucracy organization, whereas coming into like a large Fortune 100 company like United, um, you know, so I was in a rotational program. I was fortunate to get, so I got the summer internship. I accepted that United offer. I was really fortunate to, um, you know, get the full-time offer at the end of the summer. We had that was called an LDP, a leadership development program. And so I was fortunate to get that full-time offer. So knew I would be moving back to Chicago. Definitely makes for a fun second year of business school. A lot more fun than that first semester when you know you have, you know, a good job sitting at the other side of it um, to go back to. Um, and so I was in kind of this program. They told us on our second day, though, actually, that the program was going away. Welcome to United. This is your second day. You're going to be the very last class of the program. So we're giving you more flexibility to either kind of take a full time job kind of at some point within those rotations. They let us stay in the same rotation um, or kind of any permutation of those things. And so I actually stayed in the same rotation, was kind of on this cool project to kind of rebuild the booking engine for like if there was a regular operations, snowstorm, weather, um, cancels because of mechanical delays to automatically rebook folks. So I kind of started leading this cross-functional team that had 17 different teams. So, you know, think about kind of the group projects you're working on now. I know, you know, teamwork is so important. I know I remember as, you know, an undergrad and even during business school, hated working in teams, hated meeting with groups, hated getting together with folks. But I work with 17 different teams that all had different interests, that some were on the commercial, the revenue side, some were on the operational side, some were on the planning side, some were on the marketing side. Here I am, this, you know, young, naive, you know, just recent grad that worked in the radio world for five years, working at this large, you know, Fortune you know, 100 company, working with all these different teams. Technology is slow in large companies. Things don't move quick. Bureaucracy takes time. Getting all these folks, getting consensus from all these different folks. You know, you know, I said things I probably shouldn't have said. I was like, why can't we get this quicker? You know, this should not take, you know, four weeks to get this approved from legal and brand and all these sort of things. Uh, and so it humbled me a lot. I learned so much that first year um, from those different rotations and working with all these different cross-functional teams. Um, and so it was really kind of a pivotal, another pivotal moment kind of in the career. You know, things don't happen quick, you know, technology, you know, despite the fact that we're in this crazy transitory time and the digital world is upon us, you know, things are just a lot more complex, you know, at any company, any project, um, any group setting. And so um, you kind of had a lot of learning moments, but thankfully didn't do anything too crazy, never said anything, you know, too loud and abruptly, um, but, you know, bit my tongue a lot. Um, but learned just kind of a lot of how larger organizations worked, very different from kind of the radio world, um, which was really cool. And that kind of was the love for the operational side. You know, really, you know, always considering myself a marketing person. Operations was my least favorite class during business school. Um, kind of the only L we get in business school, you don't really get grades. It's like high pass, pass, and no pass. That like operations was my one L. I was like, I don't get this. It doesn't make sense. We're talking about these widgets and like, how do you apply, apply this to the real world? And now I'm working at an airline, like in a pretty heavy operational role. Um, so, you know, silver linings to everything that, you know, even when things look dark and, you know, you don't think you're in the right place, you know, it's, you know, never in my wildest dreams would have dreamt I would, you know, be doing baggage systems at an airline for a couple of years. That's fascinating that you said operations was your least favorite. And I think it a lot has to do with how we, the language we use in operations, because I was also primarily in operations when I was working uh, for Aon, uh, one of the large uh, risk management and, sh and consulting companies. But I think it has to do with the language and how we're presenting the material and, and of course, uh, needs to be expanded. I think it relates a lot to innovation, not necessarily innovation in terms of developing new, more revenue and more products and services, but being more efficient. And that's where the baggage experience comes in. Can you can you share a bit about the the baggage handling project? You said seven. I think you said seventeen uh, teams, or maybe it was a, a different project. But can you share a little bit about that? And then I want to frame it how it relates to the concepts that we talk about in class. Or maybe better yet, maybe you can tune in to pick them out as Stephen talks about this project. Yeah, so kind of transitioned kind of out of that like a regular operations project. Like it was really the foundation for me for you know starting to pull uh, pole vault kind of into a larger company. And so at the time there was, you know, a couple roles. There was actually like a brand marketing role, which was like, oh, it could be fun to kind of go back to the marketing days. There was, I think, another role. And then kind of this third kind of baggage project that was essentially a PM project manager role 
um, for this baggage 2020 program kind of this was probably back five years ago. What do we envision all of our baggage ecosystems looking like? Again, this is the person that hated the operations class, you know, really just was like, what am I doing? But again, it was an uncomfortable moment that, you know, okay, let's step out of the comfort zone and try to challenge myself and do something that feels a little uncomfortable, but it could be a good opportunity. And that really ended up being another kind of just moment where I just learned tons. So I got to lead the Denver baggage handling system. It was the only hub. Hubs are kind of the larger, you know, airports that have a lot of transiting customers that connect in them um, and funded that project from start to finish. It was almost a $200 million program. Um, so again, working with dozens of other cross-functional teams, um, getting into the weeds of all these systems, you know, working with all these vendors that, you know, have, you know, 20 years of technical experience building baggage conveyors and all these sort of things um, was just really, really cool and really fell in love with that. You know, built tons of connections, you know, with the external communities. Well, obviously you work with a lot of people internally, you know, at companies you work with, but this role provided me a lot of opportunity to work externally with folks and understand how other large businesses work, what other challenges are with process, um, things like that. And so kind of all those theoretical things you learn about kind of in the textbook and your course packs and things like that, this kind of role really brought a lot of those to life um, from a day to day perspective. Uh, we got to the place where we had kind of a vendor competition with kind of the two big vendors in the baggage world going head to head. We gave one of them a project in Dulles, one of them a project in Denver, and ultimately kind of, you know, they went head to head and developed a business plan over 180 days. We did a mini pilot and proof of concept. I don't know if you've heard of that word before, but where you sort of test something at a smaller scale and scope before you go build kind of the $200 million program and kind of see who does the best job. And so um, just incredible from a connection, still keep in touch with a lot of these folks. Actually went to one of their weddings um, a month or so ago out in Charleston. And so just the relationships, the people, the experience to learn, you know, what you kind of do outside of it, you know, is just really, really awesome. So never thought in my wildest dreams, you know, I would be building baggage systems and leading a cross-functional team from that end, but it goes to show you don't ever discount anything. Um, you just kind of never know where that career path is going to go. And for those who are interested in taking the scalability class, we do a much, or we do a deeper dive into innovation. And one thing that I want to do is frame what Stephen just talked about, because while we can think of new products and services as being a form of R and D and new new business and and um, new products and driving top line revenue, we also have to innovate the way that you do business, which differentiates you from other competitors. And we still call this uh, sustainable competitive advantage or competitive advantage that you're trying. So United was trying to, through its hubs, through the baggage handling, create more efficiencies, of course, probably reduce cost over the long term, but also differentiate themselves from other their competitors. And this is a massive project. So, of course, there are leaders who envision this, whatever, who have lots of years of experience. But then you need these champions like Stephen, who's going to go out and execute it. And you may think that's a project manager, but there, it's someone much more than that. It's someone who is a subject matter expert across all these different divisions, knowing, researching, building these relationships, doing a deep dive, understanding what the pain points of these individuals or these groups to be able to articulate how the solution is going to come down and create value for them. Not necessarily value in terms of money, but saving time, ease of work, synergies, et cetera. So we can see that that person also needs to be an innovator or have an entrepreneurial mindset because they have to deep dive and know their quote unquote customers, which are their peers and their colleagues that they don't manage. They have no authority over they have to persuade them to enroll them into their vision of why they should adopt this why they should share their feedback Stephen talked about the proof of concept we could consider this as a form of minimal viable product to test our assumptions and he talked about this head-to-head -head of these two vendors we can consider this a competition competition is a very uh, a contest can be a form of a competition and an innovation contest is very popular for organizations to innovate. We could suggest he had to do a lot of tests and pilots and surveying and prototyping and mock-ups, all of these things to persuade his customers or colleagues and clients that are within the firm to want to adopt this, to in, uh, adopt it in their business processes, to share their pain points and et cetera. 
So we can start seeing how this operations role is really uh, an ind potentially an individual who's implementing the innovation internally uh, and knowing their stakeholders, but using the same skills that we're teaching in these innovation and entrepreneurship classes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I'm also curious on a, um, uh, when, when you're implementing these projects, that maybe the, the role of technology or the corporate role in terms of the processes and how are you influencing people? So just like entrepreneurs and innovators, you have to persuade people to invest in your idea, invest in your product, invest in your vision, but you also have to do that. And I'm curious to know, are there some skills or points that you can highlight that help you persuade others and influence and be a, ch a change agent in your company that we can learn from? Yeah, I mean, uh, one could make the case that over the last 18 months during COVID, you know, we've progressed almost a decade in technology, you know, things like QR codes and, you know, when things got really crazy and we were losing millions and millions of dollars a day, we had to get rid of all of our vendors and consultants and essentially do everything internally. And so that's really where all the relationships go in, you know, all those projects that I you know, have already talked about working with all the cross functions, our digital technology team, our e-commerce team, our merchandising team, our mileage plus team all those sort of things, you know, all those relationships, you know, are so, so, so paramount. And we're going to just continue to see the innovation, you know, just, you know, especially in this world where it's difficult to find work. And, you know, with a lot of our vendors and folks at the airport, you know, the Denver news station just had on yesterday, last night, you know, the airport here is about 30 miles out of the city center. You know, when you can go work at Chick-fil-A or McDonald's and make almost the same amount of money as some of our wheelchair pushers and some of those roles that are so crucial to the travel experience and not have to commute through an airport and get an airport badge and things like that. You know, we're in this drastic time of transformation now and that's really where you know kind of your people leader skills you kind of hone in to understand you know how you persuade persuasion is a huge skill especially in a large organization to buy folks and get folks on your team you know as you're looking to get funding especially now when you know the funding is not coming as easy as it was before COVID because we lost so much money you know getting you know even small amounts of money is going to be a little bit more challenging for the next six to 12 months until really things start picking back up again and so just that influence you can have the relationships you've built are really critical and then partnering with folks you know our ceo scott kirby has an awesome slogan you know if you're gonna fail fail fast you know he's all about trying new things innovating doing pocs doing proof of concepts see if it works if it works and we move the needle and you know it's a better customer experience if it's you know increasing revenue if we're driving a better you know overall kind of airport operational process go for it but if you see that it's not working, if it's not winning, then, you know, fail fast, move on to the next thing and kind of go out from there. And that's kind of where that influence kind of comes in. You know, you don't do anything in a vacuum. That's why the team and the teamwork is so important. And so getting folks on board to kind of test and champion those sort of things, you know, is so crucial. Wonderful. These are the same uh, skills, concepts that we talk about being as an entrepreneur and Stephen is highlighting, you also have to do that within a firm and within a big firm and fail fast, the motto from the CEO, which we say often in the entrepreneurial world as well. So I'd like to prime the students. I'm going to ask Stephen a, one more question and maybe you guys have some questions that you would like to ask him. I kind of would just like to highlight this idea that what Stephen is doing is we call organizational change. And it could, of course, it can be technology, but it can also be culture. It could be uh, processes, communications, um, many things. And organizational change is very much and deeply tied to the role of, of innovation, right? If, if things, organizations didn't change, we wouldn't need innovation because we would just be doing the same thing. And organizational change is not easy for a variety of reasons. So this notion of what Stephen has been doing is helping to change the organization in various contexts, which we can call uh, in some contexts innovation. So thank you for sharing. One thing that I'm most interested in hearing about before we turn uh, to the audience for questions is your own project that you, I would call an innovation, the gratitude project. What is that? How did you create it? And where does it fit in um, in all of these projects that you're working on personally and professionally? 
Yeah, so it was just something I started doing back in 2020 before COVID was even a thing. You know, my mom always thought, you know, you should journal and, you know, all your travel experiences and just all the people you meet and say hello to. Um, I've never really just been a good journaler. It's like, I don't know, taking the time at the end of the day. You know, Kaylee, you probably can see the little one there. It's, there's not enough hours in the day. Like, there's always something to do. There's projects, there's, you know, grocery shopping and things like that, uh, which is so awesome. I love that we can bring our little ones in. It's some fun now that we can, you know, the team's world has changed that. So I love hopefully that silver lining. So what's the little one's name? Well, you can we can talk about it when we open up the microphone and a little bit, then you can. Um, oh, I think you're muted, but <laughs> no worries. We'll come back to it in a second when the microphone. But anyway, adorable. Um, but anyway, um, so no, the gratitude project started um, just writing a handwritten note. So it's like literally just this like you know little piece. You know, got printed out 366 of them at the office depot. And, you know, started writing it before COVID, you know, to friends, reconnecting folks I haven't chatted with in a long, long time. Started giving them to folks kind of, you know, restaurant servers and flight attendants and gate agents. And then obviously during COVID, the whole world changed and we weren't seeing people. And so it became these really heartfelt, you know, sort of mementos in our kind of world of email and texting and things like that. Kind of the art of handwritten communication and snail mail has kind of gotten lost. Uh, and so I had some really kind of profound ones last year. Um, one that um, gave a, my brother, actually this one was this year. So I did it last year, but then I continued doing it. So I've written close to almost 300, 700 some now, kind of as we go into the end of 2021. And so ones that folks that were going through hard times, uh, I had written one to someone and he had gotten my note at the beginning of a shift. He was a bartender at a bar here in Denver. At the end of the shift, he got uh, what he called his pink slip, his you know note. You know the company was changing, or the owners were looking to go in a different direction, and so he's like, you know, the note you gave me. You know, I was really in a bad place that day, but thankfully I got your gratitude note that morning. And so you just never know. For me, it's a Stephen project. I obviously blended into work. I've given lots to coworkers and flight attendants and gate agents and folks that have been grinding really hard on the front line. But again, you know, it's all about building that personal brand and, you know, folks know that you're that person that's willing to go above and beyond and, you know, not afraid to, you know, recognize someone and do something for the work that they did. You just never know the impact that they have there. So it's been really cool um, just getting those out there, um, you know, getting notes from folks that get them in the mail. Um, got one, someone to a server. I did a little pandemic escape down to Florida earlier this year. She just couldn't believe probably the 70, 80 year old woman um, at this restaurant in Sarasota and just could not believe, you know, there. And so I'm going to send her a Christmas card this year and hopefully make her day again this year. You know, probably someone that's widowed or um, single or lives alone. And so you just never know what impact you can have on someone's day um, in terms of that. So um, find ways to do it. Everyone can do it in different ways. Mine is obviously through little gratitude notes, but you know, you can pick up the phone and call someone just saying hello to someone on the street that looks like they're having a bad day. There's a lot of different ways to manifest itself. But thanks for sharing that. And I think it's a it has a wider impact than we can imagine or even comprehend. And if we do it for personal or professional reasons or both, um, there's maybe a way of, of intertwining them. So thank you for for the, for sharing that. I'd like to f open the floor for questions. May Would the audience have any questions? Yes. Oh, hey, I was. Um, I, so what I'm hearing is that uh, when you curate the total experience for your customers, it sounds like you're using cross-functional teams to work on mul multiple facets at once. And I was wondering if you have some advice for a beginner, because I'm trying to do something similar on campus. I have artworks that have mul from multiple facets of uh, survivors of human trafficking, and I'm trying to have an influence on campus. And it, I'm not sure how to go about it because it feels like it's just me trying to do all the work. I'm, I'm wondering if you had some advice for uh, someone that's just starting out that's trying to curate a total experience for a community. Yeah, so I mean, I would say, Chad, it's all about building kind of the relationships and the bridges, you know, obviously start small, start with kind of whatever sector, if you're doing it through an organization or just on your own or through a class, you can start there, but then start building those relationships with other organizations on campus with, you know, if you have like a student rec center, um, I remember Michigan, we had like a campus activities office. 
in business school, I was, you know, the career services office kind of becomes your best friend as you're looking to find a job to hopefully pay off your student loans, obviously, things like that. And so just start small. It doesn't take a lot to do that. Uh, and so ultimately just driving towards that and, you know, find someone that's willing to kind of champion your cause. You know, you just, again, kind of going back to that philosophy of like saying hello to everyone and building those relationships. You never know that person you say hello to with or who you sit next to on the plane or who you're having dinner with what they could do, what they're a part of, you know, everyone has different hobbies and interests. And, you know, it's just interesting, you know, even a large organization in particular, but small ones as well. Folks just have so many different passions and you just never know, you know, if someone has a small business or something like that. Um, and, you know, and then hopefully partnering with someone, if you can find someone else to partner up with um, to kind of champion the cause as well, or kind of, you know, oftentimes folks go into business kind of together and have two or three kind of partners or proprietors um, and, you know, kind of build all those together. And so find just different little pockets. Again, you never know, you know, you look at some of these entrepreneurs, you know, wasn't it Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook kind of just started doing this in his basement, um, you know, from there, you just never know, you know, kind of where you're going to strike it. And so just continue to put yourself out there, um, you know, as hopefully you've heard me kind of allude to in some of these different stories over the last hour or so, you know, I definitely had moments of challenge, moments of triumph, moments that, you know, felt like I was failing maybe not doing my best but those are ultimately kind of you know the pinnacle moments that help you become stronger on the flip side of it and hopefully kind of turn the tide okay thank you that, yeah that sounds like what i'm doing i'm working on uh, collaborating with different uh student organizations that are focused on human trafficking and i'm, I'm uh, partnering with a nonprofit organization uh artworks for freedom which they are a anti-human trafficking organization and i <laughs> reach out to uh you know, different communities that aren't directly related, but, you know, may have a similar background, like someone uh, organization involved in domestic violence or sexual assault and stuff like that. So thank you. You you confirm my intuition about a few things. Keep doing it. There's no free lunch, as they say, in life. Like, you just have to keep grinding hard and, you know, putting yourself out there. And, you know, so many folks, you know, get lots of rejection letters or things like that or for job offers. I mean, you can take that to any sort of principle in life. But just if you believe that and like you continue to make those connections, you know, you have great professors like Steve that you know can help you make some of those connections and, you know, have contacts in the business community um, that can continue. And just, you know, there's so many organizations too. you know, even look outside of campus. You know, I think you're going to see a lot, you know, over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months, just, you know, with mental health and things like that, you know, people just prioritizing, you know, trying to find ways to continue to reconnect kind of as we've been in this virtual world for the last 18 months. There's just so many folks that, you know, need opportunities. So uh, it's really cool to see, you know, leveraging the technology kind of as a part of it. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying by, uh, I'm starting to see that um, take uh, no's and taking rejections as a positive thing because it gets you closer to the yeses and the people that accept you. So thank you. What other questions might we have? Um, I'm sorry. I, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. Okay. I don't know where my um, mute and unmute button went. I have to like leave and do it at the beginning. I'm sorry. Um, I love what you said, Chad, about the, you know, so many no's get you uh, closer to the yes. I really like that. Um, I think my question is, so you're, you know, heading a project that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. How do you deal with the pressure of being in charge of something that huge? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it comes with kind of experience. It's, I definitely was not in a position to do that the day I walked in at United the first day. Just, you know, I barely understood how the IT systems work and kind of how the groups collaborated with each other. But through time and process, you know, surround yourself with good people. You know, you know, one of my mentors at United, you know, find mentors kind of within the group. If you're in a marketing group or a finance group, find someone there, but also find someone that's in a totally different group. I've kind of been more and more marketing operational roles there, but I'm, you know, one of my mentors is our kind of VP CFO. Um, you know, he's a runner. We connected and bonded through not even a work project, just through kind of an external kind of, I was the captain of our team United, this the kind of 5K race. And so he kind of saw that I was willing to like, you know, get a t-shirt designed together and like get the team collaborated. And so kind of saw that kind of skill again, you know, don't work with him very often because he's more on the commercial side and I'm more on the operational side now, but find those folks internally and champion them. You know, folks are willing to help, you know, at the end of the day and kind of give you that. So 
you know, just a lot of it comes through experience and time. You know, you'll probably start out on more. You know, if you are at a large company, an analyst, senior analyst, kind of staff rep role, and then eventually, if you want to be a people leader, move up through a manager level role, a senior manager. And then kind of as you start to get into the director, managing director, um, and potentially leadership kind of EP ranks, you know, you just learn more. I learn more, you know, every team, every manager, every leader I have, I probably had six or seven different um, leaders, managing directors and directors over the years. And I kind of pull bits and pieces, you know, what are their leadership attributes that I want to pull into my leadership style? What are the things they do in terms of how they lead a meeting? What are the cadence of meetings? You know, and then, you know, crises is like COVID and the pandemic, you know, you continue to learn more, you know, the things and kind of adapt. So, you know, all comes with time and experience. So just surround yourself with the right people, kind of get rid of, shed the people in your life. Don't ever be shy about, you know, if there's folks that aren't adding value or if, you know, friendships or relationships or things like that become kind of a one-way street and you're the one giving kind of 90%, you know, it's okay to walk away from things. You know, sometimes folks just go through things in their lives and timing just doesn't always align, um, but it's kind of okay. Just don't ever burn any bridges though, realizing that, you know, it's a very small world, even though it's very big. Um, and, you know, you never know who that next boss will be, who that person will be that will influence you. If you always kind of end things in good terms and, you know, just take the high road yeah. um, and you know, work through, you'll end up in a good place. Yeah, I'm taking a leadership class right now and I'm noticing things about leaders in my life that I, I guess I'd never noticed before. And so you start to realize that quality over quantity when it comes to the people in your life, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much and congratulations. Oh, <laughs> I just you. Other, a huge project like that. I can't even imagine. <laughs> it's all good. Stephen, we have a few minutes left. There's two main questions that I want to ask you. Maybe we can, uh, maybe a 30 second answer to this. Everyone's curious about the future of flying. How are we inno innovating the flying experience going forward? Yeah, you know, airplanes are not getting drastically faster in the next couple of years, but, you know, a lot of it's coming, you know, on the airport innovation side. So with technology moving through airports quicker through the TSA process, um, kind of all those technology things. But on the flying front, you know, we're starting to invest in more economical, you know, biotech, things like that, you know, electric airplanes as well. We just announced a small order um, kind of, again, more on the decade kind of horizon there. Um, as well as just, you know, even the type of aircraft, you know, as we get rid of these kind of fuel um, gas guzzling aircraft and move to more efficient ones um, like the 737 MAX, um, things like that, you know, 20, 30 percent more fuel efficient that, you know, has huge inroads on the technology um, on our kids, on our grandkids and things like that. Um, and things like that. Our CEO, Scott, was at um, one of the climate summits last week in, I think, Glasgow or Edinburgh, somewhere in Ireland, um, and spoke kind of just on some of the technology front. So you're starting to see some of the announcements, things like that. We, we talked a lot about change over the last hour. That change doesn't happen over the course of um, time. You know, start to see some of those changes, but you have to plan for it. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. We look forward to those new changes of innovation happening as we experience travel through the airports, through flying, and of course making the world a bit more sustainable through being more efficient with our, our carbon. And the last question that I ask, like asking all of my guests, if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give them? Yeah, just you know, like I've kind of alluded to, don't ever be shy. Always put yourself out of the, you know, push yourself outside of the comfort zone. You know, things that feel unattainable are things that, you know, you think, oh, I can't do that. You know, don't ever let anyone, anything, um, you know, be an obstacle or barrier. You know, there's tons and tons of people out there that are willing to help you. Um, and, you know, just remember you have the whole rest of your life, you know, it's often a jagged edge. What is that Alanis Morissette song, Jagged Little Pill? You know, it's kind of just like a very, you know, it's my career has not been a straight line by any stretch. There's been lots of, you know, zigs and zags along the way. Um, but just, you know, don't be afraid, take the challenges, step out of your comfort zone, um, you know, and do it. And, you know, you'll end up where you're supposed to be. You know, we're at this awesome transformational time in the world, you know, so jealous and envious of both of you, you know, to be at this time when the technology is kind of at the forefront, but you still kind of can look back in the rearview mirror, kind of what it's like growing up kind of without some of the technology to kind of, you know, pull vault your careers. So um, if I can obviously be of any help, don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, but the sky is the limit. So dream big. Wonderful. That's a great invitation. 
to reach out to Stephen via LinkedIn, yeah. or if there's any other method you would prefer them to reach out, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's and great, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you. We are eternally grateful for you spending the hour with us, sharing your wisdom, your experience, and the tips for us to be better leaders, innovators, entrepreneurs within firms, and understanding your role and how you got there. So thank you. I'll be touching base with you in the near future, but we're eternally grateful for the time and wisdom that you shared with us. No worries. Thanks for having me. You guys have a great holiday and a great week. Thanks, Papa. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Take care. Have a good day.